Hello, I'm doing a movie review. Well, technically this is a miniseries, not really a movie, but I've always considered a miniseries to basically just be a long-ass TV movie broken up into different parts and shown over a period of a few weeks. Like, I've always been under the impression that a miniseries can count as a movie, but I'm sure I'll get tremendous debate about that. And of course there are exceptions to that, like, each season of American Horror Story is considered to be its own miniseries, and I wouldn't call those seasons movies. And also, all the episodes of this miniseries on the DVD are edited together in the form of a four-hour long movie. So, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to be calling this video a movie review instead of a miniseries review, even though technically this is a miniseries, not really a movie. But the movie, or miniseries, whichever you want to call it, I want to review is Storm of the Century. Now, Storm of the Century is a three-part miniseries which aired on ABC in February of 1999. Now, this was written by author Stephen King, however, it's not based on a book by King. This was an original teleplay, but the teleplay was later published as a book. Now, while this wasn't based on one of King's novels, the movie is very much set within the same universe that a lot of his books inhabit. Because for those of you who don't know, the vast majority of Stephen King's stories do interlock with each other. But it's done in such a way where you can easily watch this as a standalone, and you don't have to be familiar with the shared continuity of his stories, but there are some really interesting easter eggs in this, and I'll address some of the connections that this has to some of King's other stories later on in this review. Now, Storm of the Century was directed by Craig R. Baxley. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right or not, but he would go on to direct another Stephen King miniseries, Rose Red, and he also directed all the episodes of Kingdom Hospital, which was a series that Stephen King wrote that was based on a series from Lars von Trier. Now, the 90s really was sort of a golden period for the Stephen King miniseries. During this time, a lot of his books were being made into different miniseries, or he was writing certain miniseries. I would say it was the 1990 adaptation of It that really kicked it off, but a lot of these miniseries based on King's books are kind of infamous now for their bad acting and bad special effects. I'm looking at you, Langoliers. And while a lot of them were true to the basic events of King's books, they weren't true to the tone or spirit of his novels. And I think of all the Stephen King miniseries that came out during this time period, I think Storm of the Century is easily the best. And again, while this isn't based on any of his written work, this really does feel like a Stephen King novel in movie form. The only negative I will say about this is some of the acting is a little questionable, like, some of the Maine accents felt kind of forced. Granted, I'm not from Maine, so maybe I'm talking out of my ass right now, and maybe the accents are actually really authentic, but to me they seemed kind of forced. Also, there are some children in this movie, and the child actors, I hate to say it, are pretty freaking horrendous. But besides that, I would say most of the acting in this is pretty good, and the story is good enough where it outshines the questionable acting. And the movie is also really well directed, like, Greg Baxley did a really good job here, because even though it's a made-for-TV miniseries, it feels very cinematic. And even the special effects in this held up surprisingly well. Now, the plot of Storm of the Century is it's set in 1989 in a small town on an island off the coast of Maine called Little Tall Island. And this is a very, very small community. They don't even have a proper police force. They do have a town constable, a man named Mike Anderson, who is the main protagonist of the film, but he also owns, like, a little market... 
but a major storm is about to hit their town, and as the residents of Little Tall Island are preparing for the storm of the century, hence the title of the movie, a mysterious stranger comes to their town, a man named Andre Linoge, and he murders an old woman at the beginning of the film. So, Mike Anderson ends up locking him up, but Linoge seems to know things that he should have no business knowing. Like, every resident of this town who comes face to face with him, he seems to know their darkest secrets and their greatest sins. And as the story goes on, the storm gets progressively worse and worse, and people are getting more and more paranoid, not just about the storm, but about this man. And Linoge keeps saying from his jail cell, give me what I want and I'll go away. But then certain people start committing suicide, but before they kill themselves, they write, give me what I want and I'll go away. And it appears that Linoge is driving these people to kill themselves. And as it goes on, it becomes apparent that Linoge is not a human being, or at least not a normal human being. It appears that he's some kind of demon in human form, or perhaps like an ancient wizard or a warlock. And ultimately, the people of the town have to make a decision. Do they give Linoge what he wants? Now, Storm of the Century is an excellent miniseries. Again, I had some minor problems with it, mainly because of the questionable acting, but this is a really powerful story. And there are scenes in this miniseries that are so creepy and atmospheric. Like, there's this one scene in the movie where people go outside to see the storm tear down the lighthouse, and then certain people all of a sudden disappear, but then one of them comes back, and the way she describes what happened to her when Linoge took her, it's so freaking creepy. Also, Linoge has this cane with a wolf's head on the top, and it appears that the cane is alive. Like, there's this one particular scene where Linoge's cane is in this room, and only the children can see the cane, and even though the child actors were not very good, there's just something so creepy about that, and the top of the cane takes on the form of a dog's head, and it gets all the children to want to pet it. There are also a few scenes where Linoge is talking to the town manager, whose mother died a few years prior to the events of this movie, and he starts telling him how his mother is waiting for him in hell, and when he gets to hell, she's going to eat out his eyes for all eternity. Like, there's a lot of really creepy shit like that. But there's also a scene towards the end of the movie where they're at the town hall and all the residents of the town are talking about what they're going to do about Linoge and whether or not they're going to give him what he wants. And honestly, I think that scene, like the town hall scene, is some of King's best writing. And there's some really powerful drama in that scene. And the ending of the film, I don't want to give it away, but it's a legitimate, like, almost Rod Serling-esque kind of ending, where you're really not sure at the end whether the characters really made the right decision or not, or did they give away their souls by the end of the film. And this also does not have a happy ending at all. The ending you could honestly rank alongside the ending of Pet Cemetery as one of King's more nihilistic endings. And the movie is in some ways a morality play, because you realize that pretty much all the residents of this town, all of them have these really dark, some of them unforgivable secrets, and you get this idea that maybe in some sense these people deserve Linoge. And the movie is actually very similar to some of King's other stories, like The Mist or Under the Dome, where you see how easily these people turn on each other when they're isolated and cut off from the rest of the world, and you see how easily these people give in to evil. Now, the movie actually has a pretty large ensemble cast. I'm not going to touch on all of the actors in this movie, I'm just going to name some of the key players. In the film, the character of 
Mike Anderson, who is the main character, is played by Tim Daly, who a lot of people might recognize as the voice of Superman in Superman the Animated Series. And he's really good in the movie, don't get me wrong, but as I was re-watching the film, it was kind of like, I don't want to say it was hard to take it seriously, but every time I heard him talk, I was like, holy shit, that's Superman. But Mike Anderson is a very likable character, and he's also the only one who really seems to have the courage to stand up to Linoge. You have Deborah Ferentino as Mike's wife, Molly, who has to make a really painful decision by the end of the film, and what ends up happening between her and Mike, you totally understand why it happens, but you also understand her point of view to a certain extent. And you have Jeffrey DeMunn as the town manager, Robbie Beals, and his character is a real asshole in this movie. Granted, he's not as bad as some of the other town residents, but he does definitely have his dark secrets. And Jeffrey DeMunn is no stranger to Stephen King movies. He played the prosecutor in The Shawshank Redemption. He played Harry Terwilliger in The Green Mile, which came out the same year as this. He would go on to be in The Mist. He's also shown up in movies like Christmas Evil, The Hitcher, the 1988 remake of The Blob. He played Dale on The Walking Dead. He's an actor I like a lot. I actually met him a couple of years ago. Stephen King also has a very small cameo appearance in this movie as a TV lawyer. I am intentionally skipping over some of the other actors and actresses who show up in this movie because, as I said, this film really does have a rather large ensemble cast. But it would be a sin not to mention Comb Fior, I think I'm saying his name right, as the villain Andre Linoge. And what I find most interesting about Linoge is, to me, he doesn't really come off as 100% evil, per se. Like, he comes off as being almost amoral. Like, he's almost above good and evil. But he does also seem to genuinely believe that these people kind of deserve what he's doing to them. Like, the way he judges them and judges their sins. Like, it seems like he's actually kind of disgusted by these people. Granted, he's not exclusively there to to punish these people. He is actually in the town for a very specific purpose, but you could tell he really does enjoy rubbing the flaws of these people in their faces, which you could argue is kind of an evil thing to do. He's almost like an elemental force, like he's almost like the storm itself, like he came with the storm and the storm came with him. He is the embodiment of the storm and the storm is the embodiment of him. And there's a lot of interpretation you could make on who or what Linoge is. Like, it does seem like he's some kind of a wizard, but over time, he became so powerful that he became more of a demon than a wizard. And I do think there are some definite Dark Tower connections with this character, but I'll talk about that more when I talk about the links between this miniseries and some of King's other stories. But there is also a possible biblical origin for him, because it turns out that Linoge that name spelt a different way spells Legion. Now, Legion was the name of a group of demons from a story from the Bible. Basically, in the Bible, there's this story of Jesus performing an exorcism on this man, and right before Jesus casts the demons out, he asks them, what is your name? And the demons say, Legion, for we are many. So I think you're also kind of supposed to get the implication that maybe Linoge is possessed by the same demon that possess that man from the Bible, or perhaps Linoge works for those demons, or maybe he actually controls those demons, and perhaps he was the one who was actually causing that man to be possessed in the biblical story. But there are some really interesting implications with this character. Like, at one point he says he was responsible for what happened to the Roanoke colony, and basically he uses that as a threat against the people of Little Tall where he basically says, hey, if you don't give me what I want, I'll do to you what I did to the Roanoke colony. So again, there are a lot of interpretations you could make with the Andre Linoge character, but King never says anything flat out. He definitely leaves a lot of it up to the viewer's interpretation. Now, as I said before, this movie is very much set within the same universe that a lot of Stephen King's books take place in. 
For example, Little Tall Island, where this movie takes place, is also the setting of Stephen King's novel Dolores Claiborne, and Dolores Claiborne, the character, is actually mentioned at one point. Another connection to one of Stephen King's other books, and this one is a lot more subtle, but in the movie there's this character who says that she sometimes gets these feelings, and a lot of the times these feelings turn out to be right. It's very much implied that she has psychic powers. And tying this in with the overall Stephen King universe, I think it's very much implied that she's a shiner. She possesses the same psychic powers as Dick Harlan and Danny Torrance from The Shining. Also, the town of Derry from King's novel It is mentioned quite a bit in this movie. Also, Linoge's cane or staff can omit this blinding light that could, like, control people and draw people to it, and I kind of got the implication that perhaps those were the deadlights. Like, I don't think Linoge was supposed to be the same type of creature as Pennywise, but I almost got the impression that maybe he's drawing his power from the Macroverse, which if you've read it, that's the dimension that Pennywise was originally from. Also in this movie, there's a woman who you find out had an abortion in Derry, and I think you're supposed to get the implication that she went to the same women's health clinic that was talked about in Insomnia, which was another King novel that was set in Derry. I also think this movie is very much linked with Stephen King's fantasy series, The Dark Tower. Now, The Dark Tower is a series that deals with the concept of multiple universes, but the series is primarily set in a parallel universe known as Midworld, which is a world filled with wizards and demons and fairies and dragons and vampires and other supernatural creatures. And assuming Linoge is some kind of a wizard, perhaps he was originally from Midworld. Now, in the Dark Tower series, parallel Earths and alternate timelines are considered to be other levels of the tower, and in this movie, you very much get the sense that Linoge is somebody who very much knows the inner workings of the universe, like he knows the secrets of the universe. So, tying this in with Dark Tower, I have no doubt that Linoge has probably been to other levels of the tower before and after the events of this movie. Now, one of the main villains of the Dark Tower series is this evil wizard named Walter O'Dim, also known as Martin Broadcloak, also known as the Man in Black, also known as Randall Flagg, and he was also the main villain of Stephen King's novel The Stand. Now, the connection between The Stand and the Dark Tower series is explained in the fourth Dark Tower novel, Wizard and Glass, where it's explained that the events of The Stand were actually taking place on a parallel Earth. And the reason I'm bringing him up is because there are certain points in this movie where Linoge takes on his true form, and he looks a lot like King described the Man in Black in the first Dark Tower novel. So, a lot of Stephen King fans have speculated that perhaps Andre Linoge is actually Randall Flagg under a different name. I don't personally believe that Linoge is Randall Flagg, but I could see why people have made that interpretation. If he is Flagg, I definitely think he's an alternate universe version of him, not necessarily the same Flagg that we saw in The Dark Tower and The Stand. And Randall Flagg has called himself Legion, much like Andre Linoge, so that's another implication that perhaps they're the same person, but in two different worlds. But Pennywise from It also referred to itself as Legion at one point in that book. My personal theory is that Pennywise from It and Andre Linoge from this movie and Randall Flagg from the Dark Tower series and The Stand and He Who Walks Behind the Rose from Children of the Corn and The Wendigo from Pet Cemetery and Leland Gount from Needful Things, even though each of these are separate entities, they all essentially serve the same force. They serve the Crimson King, who is the main villain 
villain of the Dark Tower series. Now, in the Dark Tower series, the Crimson King is implied to be Satan. However, it's never made quite clear whether he really is the traditional Judeo-Christian devil, or if he's more of an esoteric embodiment of evil. But the Crimson King is essentially the grand puppet master of the Stephen King multiverse. And I think tying this in with the Dark Tower series, it's safe to assume that Andre Linoge is either a direct agent of the Crimson King or definitely knows of the Crimson King's existence. So, I hope you enjoyed my review on Stephen King's Storm of the Century. Now, before I end this video, I just want to cut to two short reviews on this movie done by two friends of mine. The first review was done by my friend Mark Allen Gunnels, and the second review was done by my friend Jeremy. But this will be the last time in the video you'll be seeing me, so until next time, long days and pleasant nights to you. Hello, Mark Allen Gunnels here. Uh, my friend Christian has asked me to do a short review on the Stephen King miniseries Storm of the Century. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite um, miniseries that I've ever watched, and it is my favorite Stephen King miniseries. Um, it came out in 1999 when I was a senior in college, and I watched it um, as it originally aired. Um, I still remember just being so incredibly excited, um, just getting through the school day and my classes so I could go back home and uh, get ready to watch it um, that night. Um, I loved it at the time. I had been a huge fan of um, other Stephen King miniseries, um, It, uh, The Langoliers, uh, The Stand, uh, that all came before. Um, looking back at those miniseries now, I still enjoy them, but they don't quite hold up that well for me. Storm of the Century, however, still does. I still absolutely love this miniseries. Um, some of the reasons are the production values to me are actually a little better than some of the other ones, even The Stand. It just looks better. It, it looks... Um, the effects, for the most part, are really good. Um, and recreate, or creating that snowstorm... Um, actually was very effective. I really believed I was there. Um, sometimes when I watch The Stand now, it looks almost cheap, the way it was filmed. But Storm of the Century, it looks cinematic to me. I also thought the acting was really good in Storm of the Century. It was very effective. Even the smaller characters, uh, the side characters, supporting roles, I all thought they felt authentic and they felt like real people. Um... The main reason I love Storm of the Century so much, though, is probably because I think it is so very suspenseful and creepy and full of narrative tension. Um, it really worked for me on all levels. Um, introducing that the villain character, um, Lanoge, he was very enigmatic. He was very scary. Um... And just that refrain he always said, um, give me what I want and I'll go away. I mean, it's near the end of the miniseries before you find out what it is he wants. But just when he starts saying it and repeating it, you already get unnerved because you know whatever he wants, it can't be good. But he's also so destructive and so powerful, you definitely want him to go away. So then the question believes... Or the question becomes, what wouldn't you give to get him to go away? I remember at the time, the ending of the miniseries took a lot of flack for being too dark, too bleak, uh, too depressing. But I actually really admired the fact that Stephen King went there. Um, Stephen King does not guarantee you a happy ending. Uh, sometimes you're going to get one from him. Sometimes you're not. That's life. And I think that aspect of his fiction makes it more authentic, but also makes it more suspenseful, because you don't go into a Stephen King novel knowing that things are going to be resolved by the end, because sometimes things may end on a very dark and um, upsetting note, and he uses that in this miniseries, and I think it worked wonderfully. Um, just, 
it was real a gut punch of an ending, but I thought it really worked. And um, I liked that he was willing to go there. I And I think for such a long story told over so many nights, he constantly kept ratcheting up the tension, ratcheting up the suspense, so that you were really on the edge of your seat trying to figure out where this was going to go and and hoping for the the characters to get through it. Um, I also thought the choices that some of the characters made were surprising, but also within character. Um, so even when they made choices that you're like, well, um, why are you doing that? You also understand why they are doing it, even if you feel it's not a choice you would make. And some of the choices were very gut-wrenching. Um, I really can't say enough about this miniseries. Um, I watched it not long ago um, with my spouse, who had uh, never seen it, and he absolutely loved it. Um, and he finds some of the Stephen King miniseries rather cheesy, but this one he definitely um, was completely engrossed by. So I highly recommend Storm of the Century. Um, check it out. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Just giving you guys a word of warning, there are some spoilers in my friend Jeremy's review of Storm of the Century. I really enjoyed uh, Storm of the Century. I think it's very creepy, and, uh, you know, I, I definitely love the character of Andre Leno. She's just, he's so calm and very, you know, even after he kills the old woman at the beginning, he just, he almost has no reaction to it. He's very calm and very soothing, and he just... It's very creepy how he just sings, you know, I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle, here is my spout. And uh, I just love how he knows all the townspeople's dirty little secrets, and he uses that against them. And, you know, I think the reason he's so calm all the time is because, you know, he's an invincible demon. He knows that they can't really hurt him. You know, he knows that, and that's why he's so calm. Uh, you know, he's just, Calm Fior is absolutely chilling, and, uh, you know, I love when, uh, I love Stephen King's cameo as the lawyer on TV, and, uh, you know, Tim Daly, you know, whenever I hear his voice, I automatically think of Superman, since he voiced him in Superman the Animated Series, and there's a line somewhere there where he actually does make a reference to Superman, which I thought was a nice touch. And I think it's really creepy when Andre just makes the mayor of the town um, see his dead mother. And, you know, he reminds him, you know, hell is all about repetition, you know, because she's going to eat him alive, apparently, when he gets to hell. Uh, other things I like, oh, yeah, also when he, I like how he's able to kind of push these nightmares into the town's folk where he's this obese report, TV reporter reporting on all their disappearances. And, I mean, he's just truly an evil character because, I mean, he just he wants to take away one of their kids and if they don't give it to him, he's just going to kill them all in the worst way possible. He's going to make them jump into the ocean, which is a slow and painful death. And he won't lose a minute of sleep over it, if he even does sleep. And, uh, you know, I just love his saying, you know, born in lust, turn to dust. Born in sin come on in. I think that's like his catchphrase along with singing I'm a Little Teapot. And, uh, you know, the townsfolk, you know, they've all got their little, their dirty little secrets, and I mean, over the course of the miniseries, it just goes to show you the fact that they willingly give up one of their children. It goes to show you just how seedy and underhanded they all are, especially when it comes to saving their own skin. And, uh, I do love the ending where he just, the main character played by Tim Daly, just up and leaves the town out of disgust. Um, and then, it's really tragic though too, because he sees his child with Andre Lenoche, and oh my god, I mean, it makes you wonder what Andre did to the poor kid while he was under his care, because you see the teeth and the tongue in the kid's mouth. Um... Yeah, I mean, I just, I can't say enough good things about this miniseries. It, uh, it truly does do its job. And I like the setting, you know, this isolated island during this cold, harsh storm. You know, because there's nowhere, no way to run to from this demon. 
And speaking of the demon again, I just love, in some shots, he has those coal black eyes. And they're, they are truly terrifying. Um, so yeah, all in all, it's a great miniseries.